So we've come down to the West Midlands to the fantastic Barston Lakes, big open water, cracking venue, stuffed with fish, and it's been a really cold day, but we're gonna try and attack the resident uh, skimmer population. There's some beautiful skimmers in here, and some bream, and then we're gonna try and put a longer line in to try and attract a bonus fish. It has been cool, so it might be quite a challenging day, but I'm gonna run you through a few of the ways that I approach a peg like this on a cold day like today, and let's see what we can get. Groundbreaker preparation is obviously really important to fishing. I like to do it at home if I can, but if I'm setting off really early like I was today, I do it the first thing, the first job when I get onto the bank. But more importantly than that is the fact that you're getting the water into it. And when I'm mixing these sort of like expander based ground baits, I like to get tons of water in it as soon as I can. And just to sort of explain what I mean is that when I finished mixing it for the first time, when I put the first amount of water in, you probably think that you've actually overwet it because it kind of goes all sticky and puddingy and starts to look claggy. Well, that's perfect because trust me, these expanded ground baits take loads of water, more than you could ever imagine. So I'll get it over wetted, walk away, and then before you start fishing, come back and trim it up. I'll give it a, a good whisk with the drill. And I can usually tell I've got the right amount of water in because it starts to clump together. It goes from what looks like a beautiful fine mix so all of a sudden it starts to, uh, the particles start to stick together and it starts to look like it's going to go wrong. That's the moment you know you've got enough water in it. So we're going to try and target some carp and some F1s and some of the bigger bream that are in this lake. And I think a really important part of my bait uh, will be pellets. And it's cold still and I think pellets definitely work better in the cold. When it gets to the warmer months, you probably put ground bait if we're fishing on a method feeder or a, a banjo style feeder but pellets are a key, a key uh, bait. And a lot of people struggle with pellets and I'm a really busy guy and I've got lots to do and this morning it was dead early so I wanted to prepare, prepare my pellets before I got here and I found a nice foolproof, it must be foolproof because I can do it. And basically I've just got this tub, it's got a clip top lid on it so it's a sealed unit. It's about three quarters of a litre and all I've done this morning is I've filled it to the brim with pellets. I've actually got two types of pellets in there, some Pro Feed and something Perfects. And then I've, once it's settled, I've got it flat and I've just filled it with water right to the brim and carefully just squeeze that lid on. And what's actually happened is there's nowhere for the pellets to go. So they're taken in the water and it sort of like, it soaks all the way through. I just tip them upside down when I, when I first put it in, just settle the water around. And then when I get here, what I find is that I've got this solid block of pellets which I'm just going to give a good squeeze, just get my fingers in, and that, for me, is one of the easiest ways to prepare micros. They'll just squeeze onto the top of a feeder, they'll break down, they're still whole, they've all got the shape, so they're not a mush because the water is actually contained, and because the, con the container is a sealed unit with a clip down lid, they can't expand, so they don't blow, if that's the right term, they don't become too big and fluffy. But what I find I can do is, and what I usually do, and I'll show you that in a little while, is I'll split these pellets and I'll just rub uh, a wet hand uh, through some of them if I just want a few that are a little bit more tacky. But basically, they're soaked through, right through to the core, and they're brilliant, ready prepared, and it means anybody can do them. It's dead simple. So Barson's full of skimmers, bream, carp and F1s. So to approach today's session, I'm going to choose two lines, one for skimmers and bream, which will be between 15 and 25 metres. And then the other one will be 50 metres, possibly out to about 70 metres. So you just need to find a suitable rod uh, to cover both options. A nice 10 foot soft rod for your short line. You're not really casting very far. You're not really casting with every feed. It's only a shallow lake. So nice soft tip, nice soft rod with a nice throw action, 10 foot. And then for the longer line, I'm going to choose a 12 foot rod 
with a little bit more power that will allow me to get the feeder to where I need it to be with ease. If the wind gets up, I need to have a bit of power in reserve. So just make sure that you choose a rod that A, suits you, and B, you think about the distances and the sort of weights that you're going to be casting, and you can't go far wrong. So on this short line, where I'm going to be fishing for skimmers, I'm just going to fish that simple Paternoster rig that I've explained before. You can probably see that on one of our channels, which is basically sliding a sliding rig so it's free running don't use your teeth just had a knot in that slide me a little sliding rubber stop down to it and then basically trim off one of the legs of this big loop should get me scissors for this and tie a little loop to create me, put me up length on. Dead simple, tangle free, nice and easy, and it catches loads of fish. So bait for today, you've already seen me mix up that ground bait, and probably interesting to point out that stage that I've used one, one ground bait. It's a one bag mix. I can't see the point in over complicating it. It's a nice dark mix because we've got sort of, you know, cl clearish water. Uh, it's expander based, uh, F1 dark, so it's not got high fish meal content because it's cold, the fish aren't sort of hungry, they're probably forcing them to feed, so you don't need to give them much feed. It's nice and damp like I explained. Then for the longer line, I've got those pre-prepared pellets that I did this morning in the foolproof way. They're ready to go to mould round my banjo feeder. And on my side trip, it's a really simple day. I've got some dead maggots and just a few, they're reds, I might try those on the hook when I'm fishing a method for a bonus fish, but I'll certainly be pu putting one of those on a single maggot to try and catch skimmers. And then if we are looking to target a big fish, then we'll probably just pop on a wafter. I've got a nice tub of bandoms there. They're uh, wafter, you know, wafter style, so they're semi-buoyant and they're perfect to try and target a bigger fish. It's a really simple approach. There's no point in complicating it. The water is really cold two degrees this morning. I think I've said this before, we're just gonna try and catch them, not feed them. Don't need to pile bait in. Get the fish to come to the area that you're feeding and not give them too many choices, not too many options. And hopefully then that means they'll single out your hook bait and you'll catch more fish. So how do you choose where to fish on a venue? If it's a venue you've not been before, try and do a little bit of homework. Um, it's quite a popular venue this and it's well well fished and a lot of people know how it is and personally I, I know that the lake is quite an even depth there's no sort of sudden drop-offs no shelves the lake in general is three to four foot deep there's a deeper area over on the other bank but apart from that it's a bit like a snooker table really it's flat so how on earth would you define where you wanted to fish and uh, pick your swim so it's quite cold I've had a good look at the water, there's a tinge of colour in it, there's obviously been a wind on, but I do know, um, because I've asked around, that this lake was frozen last week, this part of the lake had a bit of ice on it, so the water's still really cold, there is a tinge of colour but it's not sort of chocolate colour, so what my theory and what my thinking is that the fish won't be too close, because they're sort of like all the fishing went to show up in the middle of the lakes, so for my short line, if it was warmer and more coloured, I'd probably be thinking 15 metres, but today I'm probably going to go 20 metres, which is far enough away from the bank, far enough away from disturbance, and that'll give the fish a little bit more confidence, a bit more security uh, to be feed and to feed comfortably. So I've just chucked out there around 20 metres. I'm just going to have a little drag along the bottom. That feels quite hard, which is good here because that gives you a nice clean pick up for your bait. So I'm just going to clip that, that line up. If you are pleasure fishing today, you won't be too worried about measuring it. We do a lot of measuring of our lines, but don't need to do that today. So I'm just going to clip, chuck back to that clip. You can see it hits the bottom quite quickly. And I just get that bomb a little drag. Just check the bottom. Yeah, not too soft. Quite a good area, short here. History tells us that catch a lot of skimmers and a lot of bream here. And that's probably due to that fact that 
that's a nice bottom it don't get too silty therefore your bait doesn't get stuck in the bottom and the fish don't get all clouded up and preoccupied with it so dead simple and I'm probably going to start off there by a couple of feeder fulls of ground bait and then we'll chuck out long while that settles and then come back and see if there's any fish settled on that line. So I'm just going to kick off, um, I'm going to kick that short swim off dead simply. As I said, I'm not feeding no bait really. Um, let's just feel his way into this session. I've dropped, I think I can actually count them, three maggots, half a dozen pellets. I'm just going to give that a real gentle squeeze. I've got a small open-ended feeder on, which will just allow me to introduce a little bit of bait. Pick my marker, which in this case is that tower. You see that just to the bottom. I've only got it a gentle squeeze because I want that to empty quite quickly, almost like a, a baiting up. And then I'll just do that a couple of times. A couple more maggots, a few micros. A lot less bait than you actually think you need. Gentle squeeze, really shallow. You don't need to squeeze it hard when you want the bait to come out because it's so shallow. And just bait that up. Give that a few seconds to empty. Because I've not squeezed it hard, I know that'll come straight out. And believe it or not, that will be enough bait to attract enough skimmers to give us a great day's fishing. What you've got to remember is the place is full of fish and you're not actually trying to draw them in. They'll, they'll already be there. Uh, they're quite comfortable with this area. There's a nice warm breeze. Uh, sun's on the water. It's a shallow lake and the fish haven't really got tons of water to be, to be able to hide into. So I think we'll pretty much be able to attract them with that little amount of bait. Great point to know how small amount of bait that actually was. So I'm going to kick off the session. I've just fed that little bit of ground bait on that 20 metre line. And those are the pellets that we opened up earlier. You can see they're perfect now. And I've just thumbed a few into the bottom of that banjo feeder. And the reason why I've just put them in like that and it's quite shallow is I don't actually want to feed too much because I want to, you know, sort of see what's out there. And that just allows me to create a little bit of a dish. And I'm going to add some pellets to the top of that because I want to feed a minimum amount. If you look at that, it's almost level with the top. That's quite a small amount of bait. Just give me a good squeeze because I could be waiting a little while for a bite. And I'm gonna, if you like, just eye it in and start myself off. That's about 45 to 50 meters, but only Pledge of fishing. No need to be sort of super accurate today. I'm just gonna get myself set up. Just slacken that off. And I'm just gonna clip that rod up to start with, which is an interesting point of conversation. Do I need to fish with a clip? Well, real talking point that is because on a day like today, I'm going to ease my way in. If I'm catching skimmers, I'll probably want to just keep dropping it on the same spot. But if there's bigger fish kicking around, they might not be quite as bait intense and coming onto the feed. So I'll, more than likely, I'll take that clip off and just by the fact that I've been cast into the same spot, I'll actually find that I can land it within the vicinity, and I believe, in the shallow water, that the fish will actually come to you. I don't think it's that important to, to clip up. But we'll see. We'll feel his way into it and find out sort of what response we get and, um, and take it from there. So as I mentioned when I was talking about what bait I'm going to be using today, um, Maggot's a fantastic up bait. It catches everything. Um, catches skimmers, bream, carp, F1, everything eats maggots. Not a fish, I don't think there's a fish swimming that don't eat maggots. So I'm just gonna create another uh, second 
uh, elasticated stem so I can have a second rig that I can just pick up and change on that quick uh, quick change swivel and I just thought that I'd show you this little thing where I, where I do quite a lot so a lot of my hook lens because I tie them all myself um, I tie them longer so up to sort of 18 inches roughly and that means that I can use them for waggler I can use them on a bomb I can do anything I want but today I want to use it on a short four inch hook length so what I can do while I'm on the bank is actually just measure it off and tie it off and that what that means is that I've not had to duplicate and triplicate milk length so if I wanted to fish 10 inch I just trim it down to 10 in this case I'm going down to 4 and that just allows a bit more versatility so if you are short on time and you don't want to tie tons and tons of hook lengths and you might find yourself using bombs, wagglers, that sort of thing, or a method feeder like I'm doing. It's just a bit of a time-saving, efficient way of carrying less kit to do more, more jobs, really. And I'll just thread that onto that elasticator stem, and that's a 16, I've got that tied to all 15 line, um, because it's still cold. I've got an elasticator stem on, nice shock absorber. I can't see it, me having any problems, so slightly lighter line, so that if a fish does come along, and like I was saying about those skimmers, I think when fish are feeding over the top of your bait, you actually want as least resistance, and the weight of the hook, um, I personally think, does matter. So when they're just grazing and sucking the bait in, especially uh, bream, uh, F1s are the little crafter little so-and-sos they are, and I think that just allows a lighter pickup, so a nice small hook, a couple of maggots on that. I just took one one way through the fat end and then one through the thin end, which allows a bit more hook exposure. And that'll be a great alternative to that wafter we've got on. I'll just stick that on another feeder. I can load that ready when I think I'm gonna need to cast again, because you sort of get used to your bite times. Um, that'll be loaded, I'll leave it upside down so it keeps moist and I can chuck out and just speeds up my uh, me day a little bit. So, we've had a bite, first chuck, and I think it could be a better fish. The way it's, um, the way it took that, I'm saying it's probably an F1. Always a savage bite, I think they panic. But there's quite a few recently stocked small carp in here as well, so you never know. Now, elasticator stems aren't particularly common. A lot of places don't allow them. It goes back a long way, and, and that's everybody's choice. And But where they are allowed, I do actually prefer to use them because I think I decide to pull back a little bit. So it is an F1, and I do actually prefer to use them. I think you get a brilliant hook takes and less hook pulls. So I just can't quite get that. Oh, there he is. Beautiful. Just up that up so I can show you that one. Look at that, it's in pristine condition that one is. Scales on that beauty. Perfect mouth on him. Probably not being caught that often. Despite this fishery getting quite a lot of visitors. Look at him. Those fish are quite cute. Quite cute fish they are. So he fell for that yellow bandum. So we'll repeat that process. Got 14 KKH hook on with. I've actually used a band because I might slip a hard pellet on later. I do like an hard pellet. I think it sits well on top of the micros that you're using. But I was trying to make my early casts on something 
visible like that until they start feeding. So I'm just going to repeat the process, not too many pellets, firm squeeze on that bottom layer because that just keeps them inside the feeder. So I think you've always got remnants of pellets underneath your up bait. And then a nice helping but not too many because we're trying not to overfeed it. And so I've kept that clip on because it took us a while. And I was talking about that earlier, so if we get another bite quite quickly, I'll go back to that spot. If we don't get bites, I'll probably take that clip off. I might take a yard off or I might um, just try and cast near it, but we'll see, we'll feel his way through that. What was that? That, I'd, I just had it in its mouth. Because of course that's got to have moved your feeder on elasticated method feeder. And it? Because it was too quick for a liner, were it? or would it? Or would it? Like that. So before I retrieve that, I'm just going to take a couple of lengths off. I always use that first ring as a bit of a measure, so I've just unclipped, stripped two off, which probably puts it just over a metre. I'm just going to fish off the back of that bait. So it's just sat back. So if because I think it's going to be quite a tough day and I think the fish aren't having a proper chill so it might be that they're sat there thinking about the job so I'm just going to try and pinch one before we then take five metres off and go searching for them. So I'm just going to sort of do a mini stretch if you like just off the back of that bait. before we go searching. See if that gets us a bite. That looks like a bream. 10 minutes that's been in and a second. So they're not, uh, they're not going mad for it. Yeah, I think that's a, uh, feels like one of the slightly better bream that live in it. Having a little nod, lovely fish. And that's where your elasticated stem comes in. You can tell it's quite uh, coloured the water because look how pale that fish is. I think that's usually a sign. They darken off when the uh, water goes really clear. I think it's something to do with their natural camouflage. And quite uh, quite light in colour here, well. So we pinched that just off the back of the swim. So I'm just going to repeat that, go back in before we go off searching for something bigger, not too many pellets. I think that were a wise choice today. We can always put them in, but you can't take them back out. Good old saying that is. So that were an interesting bite. I'll just set my stopwatch again. That's the thing with this style of fishing. 
get your rod, stick it in rest, nice and comfortable. Keep your hands away from it. It's not, not just about being comfortable, it's about the fact that you don't be striking it. Little indications about seven minutes into that cast. Had what looked like a looked like a bite, quite a sharp. But I would just sort of contemplate on that because with an elasticated method feeder, it's got to move your feeder before your tip registers. So I actually think it were a little liner, probably just a top of one's fin just caught on the line and just gave it a little twitch and because it's in the rest you don't strike at them sort of things just wait and sure enough that just hooked itself on that air rig and uh, just pick him up and wind him in unlike that F1 bike that nearly tore the rod in but all the actions happen long before you'll see any indication on your tip if it sucks it in as it spits it out your hook sticks in and the fish is hooked and then it's only once it tries to leave the swim and it bolts if you like. That's when you see your bite on this sort of uh, setup. So because we've had a couple of bites on that long line, I mean if we imagine that this were a, a match situation or even a pleasure session where you're trying to catch as much as possible, because I'm sure most anglers actually go out with the intention of catching as many fish as they can. I'm going to continue fishing on the long line, but to maintain that swim, the shorter swim, I'm just going to put myself another feeder full in. There you go. It's like that settle. Just to keep that swim topped up, because if there is a few fish there, and they start disturbing your bait, blowing it around because we've hardly put much in it's just like a token gesture a smell and a tractor i'm just going to drop another one in on top of it just to make sure and that just buys us another 20 minutes or so while we enjoy this long line obviously the advantage today is that we're pleasure fishing it's not a match obviously you wouldn't be allowed to use two rods in a match but um which is an interesting rule i was talking to somebody about that the other day that some venues allow you to feed with a pole while you're fishing the tip, but you can't feed with a tip while you're fishing with the tip because that's two rods uh, and you're breaking the water. But um, we're pleasure fishing today, so we've got that luxury we can just feed and keep that swim topped up. That was quite a savage bite and then a drop back, but I think it's another... Ooh. Pull back a little bit then. Not quite sure, it could be, could be a stocky. or just an energetic bream. Time will tell. I don't know if it's just an angler thing, but we always try and guess, don't we? As soon as we hook a fish. Can't help it. Here's a beautiful Boston. Big skimmer. Skimmer or a bream? The choice is yours. I call that a big skimmer. Beautiful fish. So it looks like they've found us uh, little pile of pellets. There you go, man. beautiful. And just an odd pellet left. There's probably about five or six pellets left in the bottom of that feeder, which is that's where I like to see winter fishing. I was wanting to feel like I've got a few pellets. There were probably quite a few more than that sat in the bottom of the feeder when that fish took me bait. And obviously on the retrieve, they've washed out odd ones. But that just gives me the confidence that I'm always fishing with some bait, milk bait somewhere near. I think we're all fantasists, we believe that as Upbait start smack banging it in the middle of that feeder. I think that's purely our imagination, fairy tale stuff. But if you know that you've got a few pellets around your feeder, still on your feeder, you've got an attractor. And that's what this style of fishing is all about. It's a mouse trap. It's a little bit of bait. Trying to keep it all tight, 
we're picking, we're fishing for one sort of fish at a time. Yeah, we're leaving a few pellets in the peg, which will create a swim. But ultimately, one cast, one fish. You're not sort of spraying bait everywhere and loose feeding and making a massive pile. Because if we caught 10 big bream, 10 good skimmers, a couple of F1s, and you never know, a bonus, uh, bonus fish or two, then you'd call that a good day. Catching them, not feeding them. Oh, that's on. Looks like these skimmers have turned up now. We're not choosy, but you always kind of feel that a nice brown fish is a bit more welcome. But we'll keep winding these in till they rock up. And at this rate, I'm going to have to feed that short line again because I'm sure if these fish have started feeding on these pellets, I've probably got them feeding on that ground bait short as well. He's got a bit of wheat to him. So is that a big skimmer or a small bream? Oh. Beautiful. Go on, look. So the yellow bandum is doing its trick, and there again, look, there's one, two, three, four, there's a dozen pellets or so just wedged in corners of that feeder. Just like I said, it just gives me that confidence that we're fishing. With some bait, but not too many on top. Try and pace a swim. I'm still fishing to that same clip. There you go. Strangely enough, start watch even after playing it, 10 minutes 37, so that probably just took it on the nine and a half minute mark, so the bite times are all very similar. And stopwatch is an interesting accessory these days. Even if you're pleasure fishing or obviously if you are match fishing, then I do think it's important to get a read on what's happening in your peg. If you're getting quick bites, you might pack that feeder a little bit looser um, so that you are um, releasing your bait a little bit quicker. If the bites are taking a long time, you might need to nip it up a little bit just to make sure that they're not everywhere. Um, but that's an interesting theory. I mean, I've sometimes questioned myself as to, is it taking them 10 minutes to get a bite because I'm squeezing my bait too hard? But by doing what I'm doing with that like dual layer, I believe that I've got feeders, pellets in the feeder, and then the ones that I'm capping it with, they're peeling back, revealing my bait, allowing that, leaving that open to the fish, but still fishing. So it's like a dual two-pronged attack. Yeah, that's on. Another better skimmer. Lovely bite, textbook, you can see it pick it up and basically the feeder does all the work for you. It's a 45 gram banjo which is nice and positive, it means you can cast nice and straight, you're always going to reach your clip. It's nice to fish with a light feeder but not if they're not easy to cast. Look at him, in beauty. And up to himself. Bonus. Beautiful fish these. There she goes. 
I think what we'll do now is we'll have a go on that short line. It's a nice bit of sport. Leave that. You never know by resting that, that might actually just allow, if I dare say it, a bonus fish to come over the swim. Let's just see if them skimmers have arrived on the short line. Single maggot on this really light hook. And I'm going in initially with no feed whatsoever apart from the ground bait. I've put a tiny three square cage on. I've squeezed that really hard. Because if there are fish there, they've come over that bait we've fed. We don't need to feed them. We just need to snare one. So we've noticed there's quite a bit of tow when we've been fishing that method. So I'm expecting that to be the same, especially on this light tip. I'll just drop my rod, just so we can get a tip close to water. That just eliminates the effects of the wind. So you're not getting false indications on your tip. Let's see if they've rocked up. feels like a good fish so there's a lot of small skimmers in here but there's a hell of a lot of good skimmers and I expected stamp to be slightly smaller on this inside line because that's usually how it works and it's a good skimmer single maggot and they've come over that dark mix a treat lovely fish and that's right in the edge of that lip Look, funny that it's just got a little brown bottom lip there it's been grubbing on bottom it's stained its, its bottom lip fantastic condition so I will Catch a few of them on this short line. Nice and simple rig. Hardly, a, hardly any bait. Just that odd micro, odd maggot. Three square cage over the top of that initial feed. Squeezed. Nice and tight to keep that bait in the feeder as long as possible because we don't want to be getting free offerings. But what we do want is when we do hook a fish, leave the bait behind and that sets you up for the next cast. So I suppose, you know, when you look at my bait tray today, it's don't really get any simpler. A few dead reds, ground bait pellets, and then up baits for the long line. And there's multiple baits that you could use in this sort of scenario: worms, casters, pinkies, corn, soft pellets. But as I've probably tried to explain, that the water's still cold. The fish are kind of coming to you, but not necessarily grubbing for food. They're probably just picking, picking at bait. So my theory is that we've got a bed of that ground bait there, which is quite low um, in protein, quite low in fish meal content. It's a, like a salad, if you like. Uh, it's a plate full of food, but there's not really a lot to it. It's not going to fill you up. And I see maggots as being a similar sort of bait to that. So just an odd maggot, an odd pellet, means that there's something for the fish to uh, aim at, but they're not really going to fill themselves up with that. Casters, I always feel a, a, a more filling bait. They attract bigger fish. If you wanted to hold a shoulder fish, you'd probably put casters in. Corn's quite a good bait sometimes, but 
you know, obviously if we're looking for a mixture of sizes, then maggot takes from beating. And worms aren't particularly great for when the water's so cold, but it won't be long before, um, you know, spring's on its way and the fish will want to start eating again and start building up their weight ready for spawning. So I think that, you know, fish sort of get obsessed by protein at certain times of the year. Uh, spring is one and autumn, so they fill, you know, they fat themselves up before the winter. But it's the depths of winter, they've not been moving around much, they don't need a lot of food. And maggots is fail safe, basically. That's how I see it. We had a few skimmers quite quick, then it's died off and I've just gone off the back of my bait a couple of metres. And that's died quite quickly, so I'm just going to kick off another swim. And I've done that, let's say, I'm fishing at one o'clock uh, in front of me. Um, and I've just put this in at 10 o'clock, so off to the left. And I've just kicked it off with three feederfuls of ground bait with a few micros. A bit like when we kicked off the swim originally. I'm just going to let that settle down. And then just have a little chuck. And I'm just going to try increasing my bait a little bit. Just in case them fish have contradicted what I've been saying. And they do want a little bit more bait. So I'm just introducing a few micros, half a dozen. A couple of maggots. Just to see if it's bait that they want. But I tend to feel that when it's cold like this, you catch a few, they back off and then they back right off. And we've chased them backwards a bit, but then I think you lose your main shoal. So that's why I've just kicked another swim off. So then we can probably work between two shoals and with a bit of luck, if we do spook them out of our swim, they'll go to the next swim and then work that process to keep bites coming all day. So the session started off really well. Um, we went out onto that long line while the short line settled and caught an F1 first fish. And the skimmers rocked up and we caught some better skimmers and small bream. And, and then when I dropped on this line, that um, that were quite good. Half a dozen fish really quick. And then it petered out a little bit and um, obviously I fed that other line, just thinking maybe it needs to be rested, put a bit of bait into that and Basically, it just appears that the day has sort of gone downhill. Now, not every day when you come is it a fish or chuck and, you know, you set off on that line and it's half a dozen of them and you think, well, if you're carrying at this pace, you'd not be able to lift your net out at the end of the session and you're going to have a great day. But I think sometimes you've got to take that in perspective and look at reality. We've had some nice fish on the long rod. We've had some good fish on the short rod. If you kind of put all them together, it's a great catch. But over a session, you know, there's some good start and a, and a poor finish. And um, it just goes to prove that you can't just keep catching fish. It's died off a bit. Now, the, the lake, we've got this, it's quite a big lake. Uh, I'm not sure what the acreage is, but... And there's it's this prevailing wind, which is coming across as it's like a southeasterly. It's created a lot of tow in the water, there's a lot of undertow. And this tip is is right round. In fact, if I'd have known it wouldn't be towing this much, I probably would have put a slightly stiffer tip in. And that usually promotes fish to feed, but we've just had a little shot with a fish, which has reminded me how cold these fish are. It's freezing temperatures. The water is as cold as it gets, really. Um, we've had prolonged weather. It's been iced over recently. And you don't just bag up every time you come fishing. It don't work like that. So if you are fishing on a day like today and you know, you've know you had a few fish and it's gone off, don't always think it's something you've done wrong. You know, I've upped my feed. Is it that that they wanted? I've set off with not too much feed. Um, we've fed quite a lot of pellets on 
on that long line and that's also died. And I'm saying that it's probably just one of those days where as the day has gone through, it's come overcast. As the air pressure changed, that has a big impact on it. Um, as, as the winds got up the tow, as it sort of put the fish off, as it stirred up the bottom a little bit, who knows? But ultimately, we've caught some fish, we've had a great day, um, but it seems that it's just deteriorated as the day's gone on. And that happens, that's fishing. So don't beat yourself up about it. Just enjoy what you've caught and uh, log that for next time so you know the patterns. Build on that and I'm sure your experiences will grow, your knowledge will grow, which will put you more fish in the net over your season. Oh, so this was probably going to be his last fish at day because it's gone a bit dark and gone a bit cold. And we've had a good session. And I'm going to call it lucky last because, as I said, it's, it's been quite tough. They're hard to find. It's not progressed, it's not got better. Whether that's to do with the tow, the wind, the temperature, you know, this cold wind has probably turned the water over and made it quite cool and just knocked them off a bit. That's a good fish, that actually. But it's been an interesting session, good start, and slowly petered out. Look at that one, that's hooked right in the nose, that is. But another gorgeous Barson skimmer to finish off a great session. A few little tips for you there. If you're fishing a method or a cage feeder like we have done on two separate lines, a bit of swim management, just to try and get the best out of your peg really.